Oh wow, so simple, your sister made that for your back, isn't it? Yes, she did indeed. Oh wow. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> I reckon. Yeah. So everyone's going to think we're absolutely yeah. mad. I mean, we are anyway, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but I don't think the first one. No, definitely not. <laughs> oh, so, so Callum, again, yes. you believe the things about the Kingdom of God in the name of Jesus? Absolutely. We're going to baptise in the name of the Lord Jesus. Lovely. Alright, <laughs> Callum. Cafe last week, and it was Mark and Lisa and Steve and I chatting. You're telling us about some amazing thing that happened when yes. you were in Spain. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I've been telling other people that, <laughs> your story about what happened yeah. in Spain. I mean, could you, could you Absolutely, share that? Absolutely, yeah. So, a couple of years ago, so I was living in Spain, and it's, it's where I grew up. And when I was there, um, I used to go out fishing all the time with my friends. And one day, I went out fishing in a little rubber dinghy with some of them. And it was all going well until our mooring came loose. And then we just wound up drifting out into sea. And we were going, we were drifting out for about 11 hours. And we wound up being collected around four and a half miles out at sea. It was absolutely terrifying, but it was almost dreamlike in a lot of ways. And we also sort of had a lot of time to sort of stop and self-reflect. Because once your life is really put into the balance, your, your thinking really changes. And you start to reevaluate a lot of things and a lot of things you've done. And with me, I sort of, when I was out at sea, I made a promise on that boat to God that if I was saved, if he would save me, I would come back and I would devote myself to him and I would try to live by these, by these things that I know are right. And I find it so funny because when I got taken back to shore, my first immediate action was rather than going, God save me, I should really take my life more carefully now. I came back from it even more arrogant than before. I completely missed the lesson and I was there going, oh, look at me, you know, my story didn't end here. I'm that important. I survived. And, you know, I, I metaphorically almost put my middle fingers to the sky and said, ha, silly you, look at me. I've, you know, I've, I tricked you in a way, you know, and in a lot of ways, it's a lot like Pharaoh having his heart hardened and one minute he seems to learn his lesson and then just when he's about to learn his lesson, he immediately goes back on it and goes back even worse than how he was before. And that's what happened with me. After that, I wound up um, smoking a lot of, um, let's just say, things that you shouldn't really be smoking. And yeah, I had, um, I just sort of went off the rails and I became very sort of materialistic and very sort of cynical and quite a few things sort of happened after that that sort of slowly started to sort of change my perspective and I kept thinking back to that point on the boat and sort of the more I thought about it the more I realised how many things had been going wrong in my life that were completely self-inflicted in a lot of ways and it almost feels like I finally started to understand the lesson that God was trying to teach me when I was out at sea that day and it's just so funny that it, it took me over two years to fully learn this lesson and to fully integrate it but from then I sort of see it as I made a promise to God and here I am hopefully fulfilling it and basically making my own covenant with God here today and hopefully learning from the lessons I made on the boat so I don't do that again and hopefully I won't of course uh, I'll I won't be straying off the path again and yeah so so when you went out on the yes. boat were you like a, a where were you at that point were you an atheist i was a strange one so i was raised in a catholic country and some members of my family are vaguely catholic but i never really took it seriously i always thought maybe there was something greater than myself but i don't even know if i call myself an agnostic I, I believed in some sort of universal being and consciousness but i don't really know i didn't really understand what i thought at that time but i didn't believe in religion i didn't believe in the word of our lord and i didn't take any of that seriously i was i was just far too cynical and far too wrapped up in myself and my own materialistic views of the world and, well, my yeah. point is that there, there you were as a young guy drifting out of sea thinking you know i'm gonna yeah. get scribbled 
and uh, you turned to God, right? That was the strangest thing, yeah. Even though you yeah. were yeah. like... Because I'd, I'd never said believe. a prayer in my life. I was always <laughs> cynical of churches and religious people as a whole. And when I was out in the boat and I was thinking, oh, now I could actually, I could actually die here. This could actually be it. And the, the chances of being found that far out, we were told by the Coast Guard, were absolutely astronomically low. And when I was out that far, I remember it was so strange. I remember feeling this direct connection. The moon was so bright and it was reflecting off the water and the water, it didn't just feel deep, but it almost felt like I was floating. I was aware of how much space was beneath me. And it was just, I felt so small and so, not necessarily insignificant, but I was sort of very aware of my place in the world. And yeah, it was just so strange to have this feeling, this feeling of connection, and I started actually talking out loud to God, and that was something, as I was doing it, it just felt natural, it was something that I didn't even question at the time, and when I came back from the boat, because it contradicted everything I thought about myself, I just immediately went, oh, that was just a moment of madness, but I find it so funny how most people, even if they're non-religious, most people, when, they, when things are really put into perspective and their life is really in the balance, most people tend to turn to God. And I think that that just really goes to show something. We all, we all have a sense of it and we all know that it's there, but some of us, we just find it a lot easier to sort of rationalize it away and try to hide from it so that we can sort of justify our actions. And that's the thing, I don't want to justify my actions anymore. I want to do the right things and really put in that extra effort and really take that extra step. Oh, well. yeah, um, so you and me started emailing each other. Yes. But that must have been after you got the Bible app. Yes, it was. So how, how did that happen? You, you didn't find the Bible app on your boat. No, no. So that's the craziest thing. So after I came back from that, and it was after I moved back to the UK that I really started to sort of consider these things a little bit more. And after a little while, my um, once I once I actually started to look into Christianity and started to take these things a little bit more seriously, due to a couple of strange sort of things I noticed, a few little signs, we all, we all have experienced them. Um, I started looking into scriptures and I started actually reading the Bible. I decided that I would start reading it from Genesis through to um, Revelation. And as I was reading it, the more and more I read of it, the more that I saw myself in it, the more I saw other people, the more I saw the world reflected in it. And from there, just so many bonkers things started happening. Um, one was while I was at work one day, a chap comes in and he um, was actually a lecturer at a university and he um, said to me, we started talking about theology once he noticed my little cross around my neck and we started talking about theology and um, he said, oh, well, if you come around to my house, I have loads of books. I'm actually downsizing and um, I can't keep all of these books. You can come and take any of them that you like. So I go over and it was quite funny because just as I started to really take an interest in Christ and Christianity, you know, this chap shows up and offers me all of these books. So I went there and I filled my mum's car with all of these old beautiful books. And then after that, um, I started talking to a friend of mine who was a Christian. So I started sort of talking to her a bit to try and understand things a little bit better. And she put me in touch with the, um, the Bible app. And it was through that app that she um, also said that if you um, speak, if you send an email to the people who uh, run the app, that they can also send you a Bible. And I looked into the Bible, one of these beautiful ones, <laughs> and um, I noticed that it, I looked, at, I actually looked up the type of Bible, the New European Version, and it was interesting because the way that it's written, the way that it's phrased is very easy to sort of understand compared to the Bible that I had before. The Bible I had before had lots of vowels and yees and, you know, words that are very, very heavy going. So I sort of bought this one to try and deepen, uh, so I sort of, I messaged, uh, I sent an email to the, um, to the uh, email address provided on the website that was linked on the app. And I thought, well, this Bible would be a much sort of better way to really acquaint myself with the stories before I really carry on with my other one so I can deepen my understanding. And I sent an email to Duncan here and he goes, oh, well, it turns out that I'm actually going to be in Bath very soon. Would you like to meet up? And I was like, absolutely, because he noticed that my address, of course, was um, a Bath address. And yeah, I met him not even a week after, I believe. And then 
um, we started talking about Christianity and baptism and yeah I really thought you know what I'm, I may as well do it there's no reason to hold off because for a while I was sort of thinking well I might hold off on being baptized and I might try to sort of deepen my understanding of faith a little bit better but once I met Duncan I was like no I think the time is now I think all of the signs are sort of pointing for me to do it now and I think that's why God introduced me to these lovely people and you know showed me this wonderful chain of events that have led to me being right here today you know, ready to be baptised. Amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Callum, can, we always say to so people now, do you believe the things believe about the Kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ? Yes, and one thing, yeah. and one thing that I find fascinating is once I started reading the Bible, I really noticed that most of my own criticisms of the Bible and most people's criticisms of the Bible come from people who have never read it. And yeah. once you actually start to read it, you realise, oh, I had it completely wrong. Or you think, oh, a lot of people have it completely wrong. Even a lot of people who identify as Christians still take it, you know, take it in ways that have, use it as an excuse to justify their own, their own judgment, judgment and their own hatred and, you know, their own shortcomings. And... Yeah, that's one thing that's so lovely about meeting you folks, because my view of Christianity is I wanted to be more like one of the early, the original Christians, and I wanted to act like I'd never heard of this stuff before, and to come and read the Bible from scratch, make sense of it myself, and it's really interesting how, by doing that, my, my views on this have lined up with, you know, all of you guys, and there are universal truths in it. Even though it is somewhat subjective, there are still fundamental truths that you can always agree on, that everyone can agree on in this book. Mm. And yeah, but that's the one thing that really, really struck me, just how wrong I really was about what was in the Bible. And I really think that if anyone wants to criticize the Bible, then read it first. And then at least, <laughs> at least you'll have a grounds to criticize it from at least, but yeah. And that's the thing that I find so interesting. Like people like to, like to quote the Old Testament and how sort of, or it can be sometimes but also they seem to forget that there's also a new testament that explains that the old testament in many ways was outdated but not irrelevant by any means but i think that's the thing i think a lot of people have some very deep misunderstandings about christianity myself included at the time and yeah i'd really love to help sort of break some of those misconceptions for people because I've got quite a few friends actually who are quite cynical of the scripture and since I've got interested in it because they sort of respect me enough to listen to my take on it I find they found it surprisingly agreeable and I've got a very good friend of mine who um, he actually is an atheist and he's highly cynical of um, religion but as we started talking about it he um, started to sort of agree with a lot of the points I was saying. And when I started to explain about the symbology of Jesus, not just the man, but what does Jesus represent? You know, the resurrection, the, you know, the crucifixion, everything about him. And um, my friend really, when I explained about how it's about overcoming the mistakes of your past, it's about not just overcoming them and not just, you know, saying that oh I made mistakes but now I'm better it's going well I made those mistakes I can make those mistakes and being aware that that was still you but also saying that that version of me isn't who I am today and being reborn through Christ as as a new better person and after explaining that to him because he'd made quite a few mistakes in his life and he's recently um because he's from Denmark and he's recently moved back to the UK to be close to his son he's only my age and he's already got a little boy but he's decided that he really wants to be the best person he can for him. And after our sort of talks about Christ and what Christ really means and represents, he actually um, went and bought himself a cross to remind himself of those lessons. Because you don't have to be a Christian in order to benefit from Christianity. There is so much good stuff in here that anyone in the world, if they open up their minds and their hearts a little bit, can really benefit from and use to improve themselves as a person. Though I will say, he has gone on to actually ask me for some good recommendations for um, a Bible translation for him, and I can think of a few. Um, and it's just so funny how someone who was so sort of against Christianity now wears a cross and is actually um, going to start reading the Bible very soon. But that's the thing, it's sort of once you really clear up those initial misconceptions that can sort of spook a few people away, and you sort of go into it blindly almost, people, re that people can really resonate with it. Because at the end of the day, it's not just a book about God, and it's not just a book about, you know, all this divine metaphysical side of it, but it's also a book about the human soul. And it's a book about how humans act and what we do. And there are so many parts in the Bible that have been repeated all throughout history, even today. And I think that's one thing that's so important. To understand the Bible is to understand humanity, to understand, you know, the human soul and how we think and work. 
And I think that's what I found so interesting about it as well, personally. Mm. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And thank you all as well. It's, <laughs> I'm so grateful to know you all. And yeah, you should be really proud sort of, you know, helping do God's work and, you know, introducing me to all this wonderful stuff. And yeah, like, I mean, I really wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you folks. Yeah, maybe really just yeah. it as a privilege. Yeah, it, 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 it really is. <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it is just yeah, so is good and wonderful yeah, for us to hear your enthusiasm yeah, for it. Yeah. We just sit there and sort of, wow, when's the last time we heard someone talk like yeah, this? Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's lifts our, lifts our spirits yeah. as well. And that's the thing, I'd really, I would really love to sort of eventually start going on and talking on a sort of wider platform, maybe even writing a little bit and explaining, just sort of clearing up some of the mysteries and explaining to, or misconceptions and explaining some of the mysteries to people and helping them sort of come into it with an open mind. Because I think mm. that's one thing. If you sort of, if you sort of ignore all of the people who have done, you know, terrible things in the name of the Lord, they're not doing it because of their Lord. They're using the Lord to justify their own actions. Mm. And that fundamentally is, you know, it's, it's sinful. And that's not what the Bible is all about. Mm. It preaches love, it preaches compassion, it preaches unity. I mean, even in, even in the Old Testament, even in the first, you know, four books, Moses, he talks very clearly about, you were aliens in Egypt once, and as a result, any aliens in your land, you should accept them with open mm. arms and be mm. aware of that. Mm. I don't see how that's grounds for hatred in any way. <laughs> it's, it's so far from it. Mm. <laughs> Should we do a Bible reading together? Yeah. Um, down for that. Should we read Romans 6, 1 to 5? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll give you that one, yeah, and yeah. I might read from my other one. I oh, yes, the, please do. Going one. Yeah. So I'll show you this one, Duncan. Oh, there was other one you showed when you uh, some of the pictures of. No, this is a different one. This oh, another is, one? Oh, yes, that, that one's a giant one that my mum got me. This, this is a small one. This is uh, a medium sized one. This is one that my older brother got me a little while ago, and it's the one that was a little bit heavy going, that yours has really helped me sort of clear up a lot of things that I was uh, a bit confused about with. But Can this I one back. Here. Yes, please. Oh, yeah, the Mox version. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. It was, it's very interesting sort of comparing them to your notes as well. But it's definitely, it's definitely very grand. It's definitely very Catholic in its, in its semantics. And yeah, it's very, so parts of it, especially with the way that the Gospels are written, is very lovely. How much so, you want to read? I'll just read from verse 1 to verse 4. Absolutely. Does it, follow that we ought, does it follow that we ought to go on sinning, to give more occasion for grace? God, forget, uh, God forbid, we have died once and for all to sin. Can we breathe its air again? You know well that we who are taken up by Christ by baptism have been taken up, all of us, into his death. In our baptism we have been buried with him, died like him, that so, just as Christ was raised up by his Father's power from the dead, we too might live and move in a new kind of existence. So, when you go under the water, that is like death of Jesus. When you come up out of the water, this is like resurrection. And so it, it draws the kind of parallel between Jesus coming out of the grave and you coming out of the water of the waterfall. Um, <clears throat> When he came out of the grave, actually there was no great, you know, well done Jesus sort of sign flashing up in the sky and there was not a bunch of people waiting there to shake hands and say, you know, nice job and all that. There was Mary Magdalene there, who came there thinking that he was the gardener. And she goes like, hey there mister, what have you done with the body? And he like turns around and says, well, Mario, oh, it's you, wow. My well, point is that he was not, as it were, you know, with a sort of halo around his head. He was looking very ordinary in the garden. And he looked so ordinary. That's the point. When you come out of that water, I mean, you, it is very significant, but you're still pollen. You're still just a wet pollen. You're still very human. <laughs> and at times you think, oh, is, is this... Is this for real? You know, is this really so? But it is, just as when Jesus came out of the grave, and Mary Magdalene there meets him, and he's dressed, dressed down, if you like. Now, there was no halo around the head, there was no white shining garments, he was dressed as a working man. 
to the point where she was pretty devil. Um, and so it seems so ordinary. But actually what is happening here is a significance beyond what we can sort of conspect into words. You know, so many words. Oh, it's possible. Yeah. And in some way, the Son of God rising from the dead, and now sin and death is dealt with. No more to do that. And so there are sort of <coughs> images that are used and metaphors and, and so on to try to help us get it. One of them is, that Paul says, that <coughs> as Israel were in Egypt and they went through the Red Sea, so we are baptized. He says, Paul says, in the cloud and in the sea. So as you know, the water parted, there was water both sides of them, and he said they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. Well, the cloud is just water. So there was the cloud on top of them, water, water both sides, and he says, oh yeah, 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 yeah there's baptism for you. So that then opens out. But there we were in Egypt before we were baptized. Um, <coughs> living a you know fairly pointless existence. But then we wanted out. Subconsciously you wanted out. Even if you're an atheist, you still want out. As they wanted out from that situation, and God took them out through the Red Sea, like you're going through baptism. But when they got the other side. They were not straight away in the promised land. They were not in the kingdom of God. When you come out of the water there, you're not straight away in the kingdom of God in that sense. You were the ruler. And they had a week for the rest of the wilderness. And every day they were fed with the man of God from heaven. And I think one of the keys to our spiritual work is habit. It's all about habit. And I suggest that you keep up that habit of daily reading of the Bible. Because that is the bread from heaven. Um, and it's about prayer, it's about habit, not just prayer when we feel like it, or when we feel the need, or, or whatever, but prayer as in a discipline, as in a conversation with God. And the thing is, each, uh, Israel wanted to go back to Egypt. They said, oh, it's better there. We had, we had onions, we had fish. We had a great time back there. And there is a human tendency to think that the past was always better. That now my life is not so great, and the future is not, is not great. But the past is better. And they had this. Oh, it was better back in Egypt. Back then it was uh, good. Now life's awful, the future's terrible. But as in Christ, that is all changed around. Our past was awful. It was Egypt. It was back then. Today is much better than And the future. It's glorious. Yeah. You know, I've seen it earlier, they're driving it, it's a beautiful part of the world. But this is a fallen creation, but it's pretty beautiful, even as is, let alone when all oh, whatever is. You know, the curse that came up on the earth because of Adam's sin, when that is taken away, wow. You know, the, the future is, is glorious. Very important. Absolutely. I think that's the thing, a lot of people as well, when they, when they do turn to Christ, it's very easy to sort of lose the motivation for some people because they go, oh, well, I've been reading the Bible daily, I've been praying, and where, where are my rewards? Where's, you know, where, why has nothing changed? Why am I still, you know, in the same spot? And I think it's because people sort of forget that God can test you. He doesn't just immediately reward you. Because again, like for the Israelites, when they're in the desert, if he had just given, taken them straight to the Holy Land, taken them, or, well, if it wasn't for taking them around the desert for 40 years, they'd have gone into the Holy Land as it were, they would have been just as bad as, as the Canaanites. They would have just wound up being exactly the same as they nearly did many times. And I think that's the thing to remember. It's that you can't expect the rewards straight away because it's expecting those rewards that shows that you're not doing it for the right reasons. It's doing it for the right reasons. It's doing it because you know it's right and you want to keep putting in that effort for something that's greater than yourself. And yeah. And I think that's one thing as well, it's about constantly putting in the effort because it's easy to live a life where you can sit around, be cynical, watch TV all day, essentially, you know, to, to use the old phrasing, to live a life of sin, you know, it's, it's, it's easy. But being sort of, having that sort of higher thought, being, you know, having that connection to God, it's, it's more effort by far, but it's so much more worth it and it makes life so much more enjoyable. Like with me, even I was saying to you the other day, it's sort of since I've really taken this stuff seriously, I, I noticed the signs of God and I've, you know, even the colours of the grass are brighter to me, you know, the sun is warmer and the air feels like silk. It's, since I've taken this stuff seriously, I've really, 
<laughs> started to just enjoy everything more and you know appreciate God's work. The signs are always there and always around you, but it's so easy to ignore them. You know, turn away and expect something huge and magnificent. But what more could you expect? You know, you look at the world around you. Where you know is that not is that not sign enough? Is that not magnificent enough? Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing. Especially around here. Yeah. You pan the camera around here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. Well, yeah. Bill and Sue. Maybe you guys want to say anything? That's the bloke's holding me. It's a wonderful witness to what we look forward to and to how things really are. It's, it's, I think that's a lovely story, the, the account of what happened in Spain. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah. And it was just, yeah, it was just so funny. So I, I really never thought that I would ever sort of speak this pod like that and it's just so funny how you know after I yeah it's just funny the amount of parallels that I found when sort of when I started reading the Bible as, as soon as Pharaoh showed up I was like oh okay that there is lessons <laughs> there I understand that now I get that and it's just so funny immediately and that sort of roped me in straight away and I think that might even be you know for me at least why I was taught that lesson in such a way so that I would draw that parallel and understand it eventually later on and I think you know I, I wouldn't have learned the lesson right there and then it wouldn't have had meaning. I had to have my heart hardened and I had to go through even more things after that in order to get to the point where I could finally actually accept the truth. Well, we find it very encouraging, particularly as you're a young man. It's wonderful yeah. for us to, yeah. you know, to be part of this with you and mm. to enjoy this occasion and to thank God. <laughs> Because it really is an encouragement for us as well. Really yeah. Yeah. Well, shall we? Um, yeah, so I'm uh, oh, yeah, a little bit quiet. I not be down there. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, where do you want to get changed? How well, are you going to work this out? Well, Lovely. Let's, let's, let's come and say a prayer together then. Father in heaven and Lord Jesus, we come to you. We are just so thankful for this occasion there to be able to come together and witness Callum's baptism and to be able to share the joy which is in heaven today, to be able to know that we are following your commandment given so many years ago to go out and preach the word and baptise all who want to come to you. And it's a huge privilege that we have. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for safe journeys. Thank you so much for sharing your life with us and being here with us and giving us a sense of purpose for our life, a hope for the future and the certainty of where we've come from and where we're going to. So bless us today. Bless Callum in particular and guide us always onwards towards your kingdom for we long for that day when Jesus appears when we can see you face to face when we can be fully in that kingdom and thoroughly immersed in the promises which you have given to us please hear us and guide us in all we say and do for Jesus sake Amen, Amen. Amen. Well I didn't know how many people were going to be here today. Um, so I, I'll say what I'm going to say anyway, although it was a, it was really aimed for those who possibly aren't quite so familiar with um, Christianity as we are. And there was one phrase in particular which I wanted to use, and as I thought about it, I began to realise after a time that anyone who is not familiar with the Bible text and it's just using the words in the way which we normally do in English, he's going to miss the point. And it's what Jesus says in connection with people who, like you, who, who turn to him. He says, there's more joy in heaven today over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. And I was thinking, if someone's not familiar with the Bible, what are they going to make of that? Joy in heaven, where's heaven? For a start. You know, we tend to sort of, is it up there somewhere, somewhere distant? And then I remember the words that Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. So there is this very real sense in which Jesus is right there with us. 
Now we can't see him. You know, are, are we being fanciful? I tend to sort of think of Jesus and God living in this almost like in another dimension. They're, they're here. We can't see them, but they can see us. We can't be involved completely in their world, but they are thoroughly involved in our world, and they're involved in everything that's going on today. And then I thought, well, what is your family going to make when I say, when a sinner repents? I said, what am I doing? Calling you a <laughs> sinner or something? <laughs> it sounds outrageous, doesn't it, when you think of the way we use the word sinner. But then I'm a sinner. Now, does this, it doesn't mean you're doing dreadful things and I'm dreadful. Well, we may, we may have done. We all make dreadful mistakes. But the point is, when we talk about sinners, what we're thinking about is ourselves in relation to God. God is God and I am not. And it's awareness of that gulf. Um, because, what is it Paul says in one of his letters, we, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's just that acknowledgement that that makes us sinners and therefore in need of help. We acknowledge that we're not like the righteous, as Jesus says at the end, the righteous who think they're all right, the self-righteous ones, they think they're all right. They don't, they don't steal, they haven't killed anyone, they usually pay their taxes, they're good upright citizens. They feel they're all right, self-righteous. And they, they haven't got this awareness of God. And so that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about here when we say we're sinners. We are aware and therefore we know we're in need. That's why we want uh, to come to God, be part of him. And then we think of the word repentance. Well, repentance in common parlance usually means saying sorry and probably meaning it. But the, the biblical sense of the word, well, it includes that. But it's much more than that. It's very much more changing your world view. Thinking, looking at the world through God's eyes instead. And it's, it's got a very real sense of you've got to a crossroads and you've got to make a decision. Are you going to go this way or that way? And it, it's, it's that choice, like the choice you're making today. You're choosing to walk in God's way. And that is repenting it, that that is the change of mind and that's what we're looking for this is what we're hoping for and this is what's so exciting me to you that you know unknown to us you know life's been turning you around in various ways and then all of a sudden you come face to face with the bible and you're this is it this is what you've been looking for and so it's a wonderful thing so there's joy in heaven among the angels uh, you know, we are not alone. It's not just six of us here or anyone else watching the video. This is with God, with Jesus, with the angels. Yeah. I'd like to ask you, Callum, would you, would you like to sort of tell? I mean, you can talk yeah, to the, absolutely. you know, <laughs> talk to Evie, yeah. and then it's on the camera. Well, you know, we're really interested, Callum. Why is it you've come here today, and why do you want to be baptised? So the thing is that there have been so many things in my life where I've blamed everyone apart from myself and you know I've done everything apart from look within at where I'm going wrong and trying to sort of improve myself in that aspect and I think taking it back to what you were saying about sin it's that you want to always be trying to do the best things you can you always want to try and improve yourself in any way that you can once you think that you are complete that you've you know that you've achieved that perfection that life of that life free of sin then that's when you've lost sight essentially to to have sight and know god is to always try to strive to do more and to be better and the thing is i want to start taking my own life a little bit more seriously or a, a lot more seriously and for me the first step of that is coming here and is basically using this as a symbol to basically show my commitment to God, to Jesus, to myself and to basically do everything I can to be the best version of myself and I'll be able to look back on this point in the future and actually think yes I'm going to remember this and I'm going to do everything I can to sort of live by the things that I know are right and the things that I know I should do the things that we all know are right like because we all know right and wrong and it's so easy to sort of use your intelligence to go away from you know to do things that aren't right because you can justify them and you might still gain things from them but you will know that morally they're wrong and it always holds you back and that's the thing with me I want to really 
make a, an effort with my life. It's about, it's not about doing the easy thing, but it's about doing the right thing. And I'm hoping that, yeah, it will not only benefit me, but help all the people that I love and all the people around me, because by being the best version of myself, I can hopefully help them also be the best versions of themselves, or at least closer to it.